um, the the movie right here, uh, there were several things that happened. Um, let's just do like a whiteboard for a little bit. Um, a number of things actually happened in the story. We had, we had um, the beginning of the prophet, peace be upon him. So we, we talked about his birth. We also talked about uh, the beginning, uh, the beginning of Islam. And we talked about, I know, sorry for the spelling, but it's hard to, to spell and, and type in at the same time. The beginning of Islam, we talked about how they were being prosecuted in Mecca. And then, then uh, they actually went, or some of the Sahaba actually went to Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. And from Ethiopia, some were finding a safe haven in Ethiopia, but other ones, um, other ones were uh, were actually still in Mecca. And later, sorry guys, later the Muslims, uh, later the Muslims were um, were um, also well. The prosecution continued, and then the Muslims were facing the prosecution in Mecca. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, went to um, a Ta'if. So he went to a Ta'if, and in a Ta'if, he was actually being stoned. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, found in a group from Medina, a group from Medina. Uh, they were, most of them, we said they were chieftains, and these chieftains happened to embrace Islam. And there was somebody that they were expecting was going to be was going to be the king of Mecca of Medina, but then when the chieftains had pretty much pretty much embraced the Prophet Sallam and accepted him to move in um, in order to bring peace, bring peace in Medina. That's when that chieftain decided that other non-Muslim chieftain and decided to pretend to pretend that he embraced islam um in other words hypocrisy hypocrisy in order to bring about a division in order to bring about a division within the muslims and we said that in medina unlike other places actually had for the first time that muslims are face to face with the jewish um, tribes and that was for the first time ever and the jewish tribes they were different um in that each one had a, had a different story um later the meccans they were definitely not happy with what the muslims what the muslims had managed to get uh, from the support um from the support that they found in medina so they decided to try to find different ways to try to find different ways in order to stop the Muslim growth, in order to stop the Muslim growth, they con continued continued to find one political ways and political alliances alliances in order to break the Muslim growth. Now, this Muslim growth continued, and the people in Mecca they prosecuted the ones that remained prosecuted the ones that remained in um, uh, in Mecca. And the Muslims felt that in order to stop the continuous prosecution, that they had to leave, that they had to uh, not leave, but they had to go for waging a war or even right now going military for the first time ever in Muslim history to go military against the prosecution, against the prosecution and in order to fight the people in, um, in Mecca that were prosecuting the Muslims and engaging in political alliances, military, uh, military force, and of course, social, uh, social, um, uh, abandoned. Uh, well, they're abandoning, abandoning the Muslims, etc. All that was causing a lot of harm. So then, that ayah in Surah Al-Hajj was revealed, 
that ayah in Surah Al-Hajj was revealed and the Muslims for the first time wage uh, the war or engage, engage in the battle of Badr, engage in the battle of Badr. And from the battle of Badr, that brings in a different shift because in that battle of Badr, from the battle of Badr, things started to change. And when we speak about when we speak about um, things changing, the political situation started changing because now there's they're realizing that is the Meccans are now realizing that the Meccans are now realizing that the Muslims are not as um, as fabric or as uh, what is the word but as soft as they had thought they were they realized that it was a growing a growing community and it was getting larger and in Medina and in Medina Muslims were now going into a different into a different level into a different level of development in Medina there were verses from the Quran that were now revealed in where legislature was coming in legislature included social um, it included um, transactions in other words economical it also included political uh, political legislature and what international law looks like how to do all that and that brought in even more um, more a social and a religious organization that was well, that was now becoming stronger on many ends and of course the most important thing was which was that transition it was transitioning um, the Muslim community transitioning the Muslim the Muslim community from um, the the Arab based the Arab based into a Muslim based and this is really important because unfortunately a lot of the Orientalists when they speak about uh, the Muslim development, uh, just like Karen Armstrong, who would say that the, that Islam was was more of an Arab revolution, and more of the Prophet peace be upon him was just trying to bring in an Arabic change and bring it into a different society. So he invented legislature. That's actually not true at all because the prophet peace be upon him from the very beginning and from the very birth of islam he was actually talking about um talking about um prophethood worshiping god almighty one lord almighty turning to allah and um turning to allah almighty with a new set of principles with a new way of defining and here's the most important which was his islam was now redefining redefining um what family went what family went uh, or meant or what economy and what success meant um and what women went meant and what rights meant and what legislature meant and the list goes on and on so that was something that was unprecedented unprecedented in medina and in mecca and even on in the arabian peninsula so now we see the battle of Badr marking as the first battle was now bringing in that transition, transition within, uh, within the Arabian Peninsula, and of course a transition on different ends right here. So now we're going to continue the movie. That way we won't make it into, um, into a lecture, inshallah. So this is the battle of Badr, and in the battle of Badr, of course, we had the Muslims were victorious in the battle of Badr. And that was the first time that Muslims engage in a war, even after a lot of prosecution. So this is 14 years from the date of the birth of Islam. All right, so now we're gonna, inshallah, continue the movie. This is of course marking, oops, what happened? It's gonna come in, okay. Okay, sorry for the lasagna, you guys. At least I thought it was. Mm. 
Mm, it seems like the bandwidth is slow, so it looks like I'll have to end Facebook and stay on Zoom. For those that want to, can you watching this? Okay, here we go. For those that want to continue watching this, I think we'll have to leave it just on. Okay, here we go. Looks like we'll have to end. Um, and here's the link. The number of moons that were killed in the battle were approximately 14 or 15. And the number of from the, the people of Quraysh were, were up approximately 70. And what we see... You're not the rope, we're trying to pick in this! <laughs> I said, cut them loose and give them orders. And they want ten Muslims to read. Well, go free. Um, worthy, worthy of mentioning here. Worthy of mentioning here is that um, the Muslims at the time the Muslims at the time or the Prophet peace be upon him had actually you saw how Hamza was saying if somebody's able to afford or wants to free himself that if any hostage of course wants to free himself from the non-Muslim uh, Quraysh group then they would basically have to they would have to um, teach 10 people in order to free themselves and that actually brought in the importance of education as well. So it was ten people uh, that were free. That were um, that were uh, every single person that was supposed to be teaching ten people. Now, one important story that I would want to say in here is that amongst the people that were taking as a hostage, you guys listen up to the story. This is one of my favorite stories. One of the people that was taken as a hostage was. Um, so let me let me draw right here, like this little map right here. One of the stories was actually um, Al As ibn uh, Al As ibn Rabia, ibn Al Abu Al As Abu Al As um, ibn Al Rabia, ibn Al Rabia. Now this guy was actually the nephew, um, Khadija Khadija's nephew. So he was Khadija's nephew, and Khadija was actually Khadija was actually the Prophet peace be upon him's wife, and this guy was actually her nephew, who is Al As ibn Rabi'ah, and Al As ibn Rabi'ah, Al As ibn Rabi'ah, when he actually married, uh, when he got married, he actually got married to the Prophet peace be upon him's own daughter Zainab. So Al As ibn Rabi'ah gets married, Al As ibn Rabi'ah again, who's actually the Prophet Sallam's the Prophet Sallam's wife's nephew. He gets married to Zainab, his own the Prophet peace be upon him's own daughter, and then later Al Abu Al As himself actually fights against his own father-in-law, which is actually the Prophet peace be upon him which is actually the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, Al As ibn Rabi'ah gets taken as a hostage, gets taken as a hosh, uh, as a Abu, Abu Al As, he gets taken as a hostage, and in order to free him, Zainab, who's actually the Prophet, peace be upon him's own daughter, she actually sends, in order to free him, she sends her mother's necklace, a necklace that her mother had given her as a gift, and on her wedding day. So Zainab sends that necklace to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Zainab at the time was in Mecca and Abu al As was taken as a hostage in Medina. And the Prophet sees the necklace and he recognizes that that belongs to his wife Khadija. So Abu uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he just said, you, tells the Sahaba, you do what you want to do. In other words, what you think is right. So they decide to release Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah. And then Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah, the following year, he actually fights against the Prophet, peace be upon him, again. Literally in the battle again, 
in the following battle, which is the Battle of Uhud. And Abu al-As ibn Rabih again gets taken as a hostage. Again gets taken as a hostage, who's actually the Prophet, peace be upon him, his own, own son-in-law. He gets taken as a hostage, and in, when that happened, then Zainab at the time, I forgot to mention that Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah, when he was released during the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked him to return Zainab, in other words, to let Zainab go to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and stay at, um, and stay at Medina. So this time when Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah was taken as a hostage in Uhud, um, Zainab is so excited to see her husband even though he's taken as a hostage to her in the end, that's her own husband. So the prophet peace be upon him tells Zainab that he cannot be like, he asked if he could see, he asked if he could see um, his own wife, which is the prophet peace be upon him's daughter. He agreed, but he told Zainab that she can't be intimate with him. But imagine how excited she was to see her own husband. Then Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah decides to go back to Mecca. He goes back to Mecca because he, he insisted that he doesn't want to become Muslim. So he goes back to Mecca. He's freed. And um, Abu al-As goes back to Mecca and gives all the, all the trust and all the, um, all the things that he owed, the debts and et cetera, to the people of Mecca. And there he announced that he had become Muslim. And Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah, Abu al-As ibn Rabi'ah goes back to his wife Zainab and goes back to um, being in Medina. All right, so let's continue the story. <laughs> Her husband, her husband is Abu Salama. He actually migrated to Medina, one of the very, the very first ones to migrate to Medina. But when Abu Salama was killed in the battle of Uhud, Ummu Salama was extremely, extremely hurt. But then the Prophet ﷺ, he later marries Ummu Salama when Ummu Salama thought there was nobody that going to be, that was nobody um, that was going to come after Abu Salama that was going to be as Abu Salama. And Ummu Salama was 50 something years old at the time. And Ummu Salama later, um, when she marries the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the, initially in the beginning, she actually refused the proposal and said that she was over jealous. She said that she was over jealous and she was worried that because the Prophet ﷺ had multiple wives that she was going to be jealous from them. But later the Prophet peace be upon him said that he'll make, uh, he'll invoke God Almighty to take out that jealousy. And later she would be the person to tell him to go to um, uh, to go to Aisha's, um, to give her night out for Sayyidah Aisha. Now, Ummu Salama, Umm Salama uh, later becomes the most important person, the most important person to give all those wise, all those wise decisions to help the growth of Islam. And she was considered as a leader within the Muslim community, um, a leader, a female leader that was giving decisions where even the Prophet, peace be upon him, in one of the incidences, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had ordered the Prophet, peace be upon him, had ordered that the Muslims would cut or shave their heads, and and that he would shave their head, that they would shave their head, and also um, slaughter the sheep. But they didn't actually obey the Prophet, peace be upon him. And what happened was, Umm Salama, the Prophet, peace be upon him, goes inside the tent. And Umm Salama says, and she realizes that he was frustrated. So Umm Salama said, get out of the tent and face everybody without uttering a word. You shave your head and you start with you slaughtering what you slaughtering the goats that you wanted them to slaughter and everybody will will follow so this is ummu salama she had uh, almost four children at the time and the prophet peace be upon him was the one that was taking care of them the prophet peace be upon him was the one that was uh, their stepfather and helping ummu salama um, upbring those children so this is just 
on a side some of the things now on another side after the muslims were defeated after the muslims were defeated in the battle of uhud the the muslims some of them actually try to try to run away and the people of quraysh did not end there no they actually went to attack the prophet peace be upon him himself to attack the prophet peace be upon him himself and it wasn't until some of the muslims just like abu talha abu talha and also nusayb al maziniya they were the ones that were in defense they were the fun ones that were standing in defense to protect the prophet peace upon him abu talha gets a major hit on his left arm that leaves his left arm paralyzed for the rest of his life unusayb al maziniya she's a woman it's a woman nusayb al maziniya or umm amara she was actually at the at the battle to help the wounded more become like a nurse to help the wounded for medical medical assistance but later nusayb al maziniya was using her own sword to help the prophet peace be upon him the prophet peace be upon him does get a cut on his face does also lose a tooth uh lose a tooth right there as well and um the or more of the rubaiyat also we're talking about um a molar tooth um and the prophet peace be upon him nusayb al maziniya and abu talha and other sahaba they were the ones to defend the prophet peace be upon him and the prophet peace be upon him in the beginning they were everybody was afraid runs away but then later abu talha and sayyib al maziniya stand to protect the prophet peace be upon him because they were everybody was at trying to kill the prophet peace be upon him um later they they go away everybody was supposed to come but everybody was supposed to regather but nusayb al maziniya was too sick from all the wounds that she got that she couldn't actually come and abu talha for the rest of his life he were he were to have um 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 a paralyzed left arm that kept him ill for uh, ill for the rest of his life all right so here's the battle of uhud <laughs> Of course, it was too late. Oh, victory! Are you away from us? Let it alone. Stand where you are told to stand. So this is Khalid ibn Khalid ibn al Walid, right here. This is actually right here. This is Khalid ibn al Walid, and Khalid ibn al Walid is one of. So so far, the Muslims had won the the battle of Uhud until this happens. Until these fifty guys go down. Until these fifty guys that were supposed to protect the Muslims' backs go down, and then Khalid ibn al Walid. Khalid ibn al Walid happens to be um, one of the most important personnels. Khalid ibn al Walid. Khalid ibn al Walid is the one that decides that no, here are the Muslims, and here are the non-Muslims. We're gonna go around them since these fifty guys that were supposed to protect their backs are out. So that's when Khalid ibn al Walid comes in and actually flips the battle from a victory for the Muslims to a defeat, to a defeat.
that's when the Muslims again defeated from their backs. But it was too late. Now, of course, a major rumor comes out that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had died. Um, really important to mention when By the way, Khalid ibn al-Walid, who is actually this guy, does become Muslim later. Um, let, let me comment on Khalid ibn al-Walid um, for just a little bit. Khalid ibn al-Walid, you guys, is a very important personnel. In fact, Khalid ibn al-Walid, this guy is, this guy is a legend. This guy is managed to wage two wars in a matter of five months almost in one year and defeated defeated the um roman empire or the byzantine empire at the time which is actually called the roman empire managed to defeat the byzantine empire in other words the room which was considered at the time the the most the the super, the super empire, the super country at the time, and also, which is at the time called Byzantha, and also managed to defeat the Persian Empire, the Persian Empire, and that flipped everything. Just, there was not a single battle that Khalid ibn al-Walid engaged in, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, and was defeated. Even when he was not Muslim, he managed to defeat the Muslims, and later, um, and later, um, he actually, he actually, after becoming Muslim, he managed to be the most important leader. Like I said, to bring an end to the Persian Empire and bring an end to the Byzantine Empire, and that's how Islam actually spread. That's how Islam actually spread throughout all of north africa and the in the beginning of asia so it was really through um it was really through khalid ibn al-walid and all his efforts so we're looking at all the arabian peninsula we're talking about north africa or at least part of north africa and later through we're looking at um syria we're looking at iraq we're looking at iran we're looking at kuwait we're looking at the arabian peninsula we're looking at well it was really amr ibn al-as that um spread north africa but this was the major defeat that that brought in the end of persia and the end of byzantine empire and the beginning of the defeat form and the beginning of the defeat of the Byzantine power. And that is the beginning of the Muslim spread all over North Africa and then eastwards. And of course, um, also to the borders of Turkey. Turkey at the time 
Turkey at the time was actually considered the capital of the, per the Byzantine Empire. And that's when later they were defeated. But it was really the beginning on the hands of this man, Khalid ibn al-Walid. This is Khalid ibn al-Walid. Everybody must remember this man's name. And Khalid ibn al-Walid, like I said, later becomes Muslim. He is up on those rocks. We have finished our business. We have avenged better. But we can end him and Islam forever. Some of his fanatics are still with him. They have the advantage of the mountain. The risk is too high. Thomas, listen! A day for a day! The day of Uhud! For the day of Badr! This is actually a thunder. Our death have answered to your death! Our dead are in paradise! Your dead! Um, they didn't actually know how to respond. It wasn't, um, they didn't know how to respond. Um, that was Abu Sufyan telling them, oh, you're dead, uh, or a day for a day, etc. But Umar ibn al-Khattab asked the Prophet so how do we respond when somebody tells us that? And he says, tell them that our dead are actually in Jannah and your dead are in hellfire. And Allah is our supporter and you have no supporters. And that's when, you know, this is something for us to learn that even the quote unquote, um, let me call it that way, the, the slogan, slogans or what we use and what the Muslims use in order to bring in that, that power is not just a slogan, but it is actually, it is actually something that Muslims live. It's, it's a word to say, it's a word to live. The part, like I said, that she cuts him up and takes his liver is not authentic at all, and it's totally fabricated. Hamza? Hamza? Do you hear me, Hamza? Do you know that I'm with you? I can. Do you remember anything, Hamza? How you killed my father and my brother. Now you do my dead. My heart is light. Do you hear Hamza? Light. But I haven't finished with you. Death is too small. Wash him. Cut him open. Cut him. Like I said, this part is not authentic. They lost a battle. So what do they do? They come home and dig the ground harder. The mad. I agree with you. They defy reason. They are even happy they lost. God sent their defeat, they say, to try them in their faith. Oh, yes. They're fighting for the sky. They'll get what they want. Do you want Mecca? They'll get Mecca. When we see the stars at noon, well, don't underestimate them. I've learned that to my cost. My friend, Mecca is more than their home. It's where God spoke to man. Mecca is like a homesickness of the soul to them. This year they're going as pilgrims. What? Unarmed. Unarmed. Sufyan will slaughter them in the desert. If you believe in God, 
hard as they do, it might be possible not to get slaughtered. But I agree with you. They probably will be. Now, a few things to comment here. It wasn't actually Hajj. Um, they were, the Prophet peace be upon him, uh, the Prophet peace be upon him had actually seen a vision that they were going for Umrah. So they were supposed to be going for Umrah. But in order to prove that their intention was just for a religious purpose and nothing else, they were ordered to keep the swords inside their their hinge and they were ordered to take the sheep with them so they take sheep with them in order to prove and they also keep the swords totally in intact meaning that they're not carrying they're unarmed in other words and the muslims go and prepare themselves to go and it was normal for anybody that wanted to be around the kaaba to go but at the time the people of Quraysh, they wanted to prove a point because of the Battle of Badr. Now it was becoming more of an even, an even win victory, one victory and one defeat in order to bring about a political stance right here and say no, telling the Muslims that no, we're going to prevent you and we're going to prove to you that we're going to prevent you. This is a very important move right here. So stay, um, stay with us because this is a total change in Muslim history as well. And what they're saying is labbaik Allahumma labbaik labbaik la sharika laka labbaik inna alhamda wal ni'mata laka wal mulk. Labbaik means we turn to you, Lord Almighty. We um, we are coming and answering and answering the the call. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. We um, we hear come uh, obeying your 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 orders or obeying your um, your uh, your your mission and your or the call that you ordered us to come and there's no we don't associate partners with you and it's very important to mention that the people of Quraysh were doing already certain certain rituals around the Kaaba but naked they were going around the Kaaba naked they were going around and doing certain things that was still some of the things that remained from the time of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And let's continue. This area is actually called Al-Hudaybiyah. Al-Hudaybiyah. This place is called Al-Hudaybiyah. This tree right here is actually um, the tree that they would sit on, but later it was cut. So the people that 
were from the Quraysh, they were actually coming in to test the waters and to provoke the Muslims in order to engage in a battle. This is Khalid ibn Walid, the mastermind and the, the later man to defeat the Persian and the Byzantine Please, empires. Do not, do not let them provoke you. That is what they want. Stand firm. It's you. they head back because they couldn't provoke the Muslims into a war. One very, one very important thing that happened in the background, listen to this, so in the background the Prophet ﷺ had already sent, had already sent his own son-in-law and his own Uthman ibn Affan, one of the most important people. Uthman ibn Affan was sent to Mecca in order to bring up to more like a like a political delegate, more like an ambassador to talk to the people of Quraysh. But they held Uthman ibn Affan as a as more like a like a hostage and kept him from going back to the Prophet and spread rumors that Uthman bin Affan was killed. So they spread rumors that Uthman bin Affan was killed. And the reason why the people of Quraysh spread that rumor was in order to provoke the Muslims to really engage in the battle and engage in, in um, the war that they wanted, which is the battle of another battle. But the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ at the time all he said was that he ordered that the Sahaba would prepare and in, in, that, in that state that they would actually do bay'ah, bay'ah like an, a pledge, where they would engage in the pledge that in case a war were to happen, whoever wants to pledge that they would be there to wage the war with, the, in other words, to defend or uh, participate in the battle that they would be there. Now. The Prophet ﷺ, on the other hand, when it came to Uthman bin Affan, the Prophet ﷺ had the wahi, the wahi meaning Jibreel salam told him that Uthman bin Affan was not actually killed. So the Prophet ﷺ told them that, okay, I'm going to do my hand. He held one hand and shook one hand with the other, and he said, this is on behalf of Uthman. Yep. So he put them together and he said, this is on behalf of Uthman and the Prophet ﷺ then gets the Sahaba lining up, lining up to pledge that in case a battle were to happen, that they would be there to support the Prophet ﷺ. And that brings in another move. Oh, 
prophet says, all who love God must renew their oath to him under the tree. I don't know why they called it oath. It's supposed to be pledge. Because an oath is something else, but. And this becomes bay'at al-rudwan. Now here, it's very important to say that Khalid ibn al-Walid was actually this guy. Um, right while he's watching this and all that, later he actually becomes Muslim. It isn't until now that he becomes Muslim. And this guy, remember Khalid ibn al-Walid. Let's send someone else. Oh, yeah. That means we might come to an agreement. There were actually several that came in before Suhail, and um, Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr is a very important personnel. Unfortunately, not many know Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr is one of the most important personnel that even after. Um, so right here, Sahid ibn Amr um, comes in, but there were other people that came in, but the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard that it was Suhail, and Suhail means ease, that's when the Prophet ﷺ said, if it's Suhail, then sahula amrukum. Just by looking at the name, he felt, let's get that from the name itself some inspiration. And he, he felt that... Suhail, his name to mean ease, that means let's get at least uh, that optimism that things are going to be easy based on his name, that things are going to be easy. Suhail ibn Amr, he comes in, and you guys are going to see what, what's going to happen, but uh, because I don't want to keep on start, uh, uh, um, uh, pausing the movie frequently, Suhail ibn Amr, he makes an agreement with them, and part of the agreement was one Anybody that were to become Muslim from the people in Mecca was to be turned back, turned back to Mecca. So if anybody becomes Muslim from Mecca, that the Muslims in Medina would not take him in, but in fact, reject him to go back. Then the other part was who, um, that the Muslims would not go for the Umrah or Hajj, Umrah, or Hajj this year, but in fact, that they would go back and they can come back next year and only for three days that they would do Hajj or Umrah, but in and out only in three days. So you're basically really not doing anything, um, barely doing, doing anything. And that if anybody from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, um, political alliances from the people of Quraysh and from the Muslims that if anybody would wage a war on the other, then this treaty, this treaty would end. Then that would be the end of that treaty. Well, something else happened. Remember, every single person was to be turned back. Well, here's one thing that happened right after, right after, literally right after this agreement was signed. Suhail's own son comes in, Suhail's own son comes in and then announces that he had become Muslim and is coming to complain the prosecution that he is facing from his own father and yells out, please support me, please help me. But the Muslims had already, the Prophet peace be upon him, had already made the agreement that anybody that becomes Muslim from the people in Mecca, that they are to be re returned. And indeed, right in front of everybody, Suhail slaps his own son and orders the guys next to him to sh uh, shackle him, tie him up, and take him back to, to Medina, to take him back to Mecca, sorry. And that and that one was actually Abu Basir. Well, not only him and Abu Jandal, sorry, not only him, but later the Prophet, peace be upon him, gets another another guy. His name is Abu Basir. 
Abu Basir, same thing. He becomes Muslim in Mecca, manages to run to Medina, but then the soldiers of the Quraysh group, they go to Medina and they say, you know, there's this guy, Abu Jandal, we want him back. So the Prophet ﷺ just says, Abu Jandal or Abu Basir would be able to wage a war by themselves if only they had other men to support them. Now, pay attention to this. So that if only they had other men to support them. On the way back, Abu Basir, he had two guys that were, you know, taking him back and holding him. That's when Abu Basir manages to free himself by taking one horse and even the weapons of one of these guys and actually go back and bring about other guys it, because the Prophet Sallam, he would be, said he would be able to wage a war if only he had other men with him. And that is the first Muslim guerrilla war. That was the first ever Muslim guerrilla war. And then the people of Quraysh would then ask that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would say, would order these groups that are waging a guerrilla war, war to stop and and stop and not fight the Muslim and not fight the people in Quraysh. But the Prophet ﷺ said, "Well, you said they're not part of me, so why are you putting? Why are you asking me to stop them? They're just trying to defend themselves on their own." And then later, um, later the people of Quraysh they said, "Okay, we'll give up on we'll give up on that uh, piece uh, that part of the treaty, and anybody that becomes Muslim can go back." It, another person that, um, and her name is Um Kulthum, Um Kulthum bint Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. And bint Kulthum bint Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt at the time was just a young teenager. Bint Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was just a young teenager who had become Muslim. And she actually goes, she actually goes to, um, uh, she actually goes to Medina, and in Medina, um, seeking the Prophet, peace be upon him, support. But her two brothers, Walid and Ammar, they actually follow her and ask the Prophet ﷺ to return Um Kulthum. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, Um Kulthum, you got to go back with your brothers because we made a treaty. So Um Kulthum complains and she says, you can't deal with the guys the way you deal with the women because we are weaker. You can't let that go and return me to them because you're going to be putting me in a very huge dilemma and a prosecution that as a woman I cannot face. And that's when that ayah in Surah Al-Mumtahina in Surah Al-Mumtahina was revealed. Um, oh, you believe if any of the women come to you um, any of the women come to you then test them and test their their faith if they are coming in for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then let them stay and if they're not coming for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then that they would be returned so this is just a you know just a short thing just about Suhail ibn Amr and what happened later by the way Suhail ibn Amr when the Prophet, peace be upon him, dies, he becomes the main person to give that ceremony and put the Muslims back together into a unity. Later, Sahail ibn Amr actually becomes Muslim and in fact becomes one of the major leaders to bring Islam in, um, in, in other places. Sahail ibn Amr, after becoming Muslim, um, in the beginning, during the Battle of Hunayn, during the Battle of Hunayn, does actually leave Islam and then comes uh, goes back to Islam again. Um, what? Yeah, he yep he left Islam and then became Muslim back again. There's actually a number of Sahaba that left Islam and came back to Islam again after leaving it. And part of those, maybe it's worthy of mention. Um, part of those that left Islam and, and then came back to Islam again was um, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. His name is Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. Ibn Abi Sarh. He, le he left Islam and became Muslim um, again later. Oh, I'm not sure what happened. Um, and, it's, and, and later, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh was 
uh, later actually becomes the major leader, the major leader to bring Islam to all over North Africa. So Libya, Libya and Chad and Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco and Mauritania actually became Muslim through Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh and Uqba ibn Nafa. Uqba ibn Nafa and Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh were the major two leaders to bring Islam to North Africa. Yeah, even though Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh, in the beginning, he migrated to Medina and then left Islam and then went back to Mecca. You know, he migrated to Medina, goes back to Mecca and stays way, um, doing all that poetry, warmongering against the Prophet and by the way, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh is actually Uthman ibn Affan's milk brother. We'll talk about him later um, so we can stick on the topic and not give, uh, get um, far. Sorry, you guys, I can easily get, uh, get, uh, get away from the main topic. Oh, you have been given conditions of truce between yourself and Mecca. Have you agreed to them yet? What is this? In the name of God, the most gracious. Who is this new God they call gracious? I do not know. Strike him out. By the way, the Muslims were getting angry right now. Muhammad, the messenger of God. If I had thought you were the messenger of God, I would not have fought you. Make it uh, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, agrees with Suhail, the son of Amr. That is more factual. Well, so I understand. I think he's a great actor. <laughs> Good, that is better. Now, it is agreed that you do not continue your pilgrimage. You must turn round and go home. Mecca is home. However, you may continue your pilgrimage next year. And for three days only. In and out. We also agree to the truce for 10 years. During that time, you will not attack any tribe or ambush any caravan or any individual associated with us, and vice versa. If you injure any one of us, the truce ends, and vice versa. Is that clear? Such a great actor. Ten years. Ten years of peace. We need that time. We will use that time. Now, this marks a shift. Let me pause it right here. The shift is right now from delivering Islam to the Arabian Peninsula to actually going outside of the Arabian Peninsula. And remember how the movie started with those horsemen um, in the beginning of the movie? And that's where the movie, The Message, actually gets its name from. That's the when the Muslims um, right now felt that there's going to be peace and they're able to continue, and the Prophet ﷺ is able to continue spreading the message onto other places and that there's security and he's able to do what he wanted wanted to deliver the message because anyways the people of Quraysh are not warmongering and not uh, bringing in more allies to fight the Muslims that's when the, the prophet peace be upon him actually sends messages so these messages were actually sent to the kings so now we're looking at it, sending it to the kings. And the kings were um, the king of Alexandria, king of Alexandria, the king of Ethiopia, 
the king of Persia, the king of um, the king of the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and also another king. I forgot which country that was, but those are different kings that were sent to them in order to tell them about Islam, in order to um, spread the message. But every single king reacted differently. The Alexandrian king, um, who was Coptic, so it was the Coptic Egyptian king, he reacted differently and he said, well, I didn't find anything special about the message of Islam. It's not any, it's not much of a difference from what the faith that I'm embracing. So he sent the Prophet ﷺ two slave women that were Maria, Maria, and um, the other one, I believe her name was Nisreen, um, Nisreen. So Nisreen and Maria, and also um, it was, it was, um, it was like a bull that was also sent with some money and clothes and stuff. So that was more like a political, like a political, uh, you know, paying a tribute and respect, you know, although he didn't necessarily become Muslim. Uh, the Ethiopian king on the other side later embraces Islam and his name is Ashama. He later embraces Islam and indeed he becomes Muslim. And, you know, I forgot to mention somebody else. I'm going to talk about him in just a bit. Um, later, the Persian king actually kills the, the Persian king kills the Muslim uh, the Muslim ambassador that was sending the note. And later, also the Byzantine Empire um, was still very suspicious and did not take it did not take it um, easily, and was was preparing to bring about a war against the Muslims. And that's when they send 40,000 troops near the area of Yarmouk in Jordan in order to face the Muslims. So this is, this is gonna take some time right here. Now, one thing, one thing to mention, oh, and by the way, the, the Alexandrian king and the two slaves that he had sent, one of them was Maria, so Maria, and Nisreen. Nisreen later is taken by Hassan ibn Thabit and Maria, later uh, the Prophet peace be upon him, although offered Maria to be freed, but she refused to be freed and preferred that she would not be freed, but be with the Prophet as a concubine, so more like Hajar. She refused to be freed because she felt that the hijab and all that was going to be hard for her, hard on her, and she preferred not to be freed and wanted to stay as a concubine and later becomes the mother uh the prophet peace be upon him's son's mother so she becomes and the prophet ﷺ would have a son his name is ibrahim and this was actually his mother um maria herself maria she later although called the qatiya the coptic she does actually become muslim and um just a little bit about this uh, it's very also important to mention that the Ethiopian king, after becoming Muslim, the Muslims actually pray the distant, the distant janaza on the Ethiopian king. On the Ethiopian king. Now, because the Persian Empire had killed the that ambassador that was sent by the Muslims, that is the result that resulted in the war against Persia. And later when the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Empire, um, they, they also did not react good to the message. Um, and later, way, later set 40,000 troops in order to wage a war against the Muslims. We'll talk about that later, inshallah, but just, you know, heads up on some of the things. Okay, what does it mean now? What is what is the, the message and how things are unfolding little by little? Although here they show three people, but it's actually, it, they're actually These six. From Muhammad, messenger of God, to the rulers of the world, call the world to Islam, to Heraclius, Emperor of Byzantium, Kisra, Emperor of Persia, Mukalkas, Patriarch of Alexandria, 
God go with you. By the way, that call, whenever something happens, God is great and Allahu Akbar was not actually the sunnah, wasn't actually practiced. I'm not sure where the producer gets it from. Yeah, it was not the sunnah and it was not practiced by the Muslims. But, you know, right now, make sure you don't say that on the plane. You could be kicked out of the plane. It is not superior to a foreign language. Nor a white man superior to a black. All return equally to God. Unless you desire for your neighbor what you desire for yourself, you don't have faith. Of course, during this time, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was actually uh, using this peaceful time in order to teach Islam to the Muslims. So now it's the time for teaching Islam and learning a lot. There was a lot of new new verses that were being revealed. This didn't last long. That truce didn't last long because later we're going to see how um, some of the alliances of Quraysh did actually wage a war. So it didn't last long, but then they still made use of it. And on the other side, on the other side, there were other non, let's call them non Quraysh at least, there were other non-Quraysh, um, uh, non-Quraysh, what is the word, but uh, non-Quraysh political changes and th um, that are feeling that the Muslims were becoming a threat. Part of that, a very important story, listen to this guy. Uh, this, this guy is, his name is Sasan ibn Badan. Sasan ibn Badan, all right? Listen to this story. Sasan ibn Badan, so here's the Arabian Peninsula, is from Yemen, all right? And all this was considered Persia, all right? Persia included the power of all, all the North Arabian Peninsula and with all the Arabian Peninsula, and you're talking about Kuwait, you're talking about Iraq, you're talking about Iran, you're talking about not only that, but including Yemen. Even Yemen was under that, that superpower of the Persian Empire. Sasan ibn Badan was the deputy in Yemen. Per, the Persian Empire, of course, was not comfortable with seeing the Muslims not having any kind of any kind of at least uh, uh you know enemies and that things are going peacefully and that they had a truce to stop the war for 10 years the persian empire definitely did not like that so he sent a note with in in the way that used to persia was considered a superpower at the time so they would have one man here one man here one man here and they had the fastest mail system they had the fastest mail system and then the message would go to sesen ibn Badan, and he was he was he was supposed to, he got the message from the persian king that he was supposed to get some news about the growing threat of Islam in Medina. So Sasan ibn Badan sends two guys to go to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in Medina. They go for with one message. The message was, listen, surrender to the great king of Persia or face an army that will bring an end to you so the prophet peace be upon him said come to me tomorrow tells these two guys come to me tomorrow they come in tomorrow and the prophet peace be upon him tells the two guys tells him tell your deputy that his grand king had been killed and if Sasan were to become Muslim, if he becomes Muslim, then he would be the king, the ruler, over the area he's ruling. And if he does not 
become Muslim, well, expect Muslims to grow and eventually go to his his um, uh, uh, territory. So these two guys, indeed, they carry the message. Remember, they carry the message and they go to Sasan ibn Badan. They tell Sasan ibn Badan, they say, hey, this is the message that he gave us. Sasan ibn Badan gets confused with this message. How was it that the grand king, my grand king, had died when we have the fastest mail system and I didn't get any news? Why on earth would he say such a news when I didn't even get anything? What on earth is he talking about? So he waits for a couple of weeks and then he gets the news that indeed the grand king had died. But the Persian empire had kept it a secret for some time, just so, and the, the, the grand king had been killed by his own son. His own son, um, his own era had actually killed him in order to be the king. And the king, or that new king had actually kept it a secret. So by then Ibn Sasan calculated the time it would take to get this news from these two men and what the two guys were, those two guys that were going to the Prophet were telling him and what he outcomes and the outcomes. And he said, and then by then Ibn Sasan figures that what the message the message that he got was actually a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's absolutely no way that he can get this type of information that fast and there is no, there, there, and this is like, this is inside, it's like saying inside White House. You know, this is real top secret information that nobody can get to that fast, and especially that he said, come to me tomorrow. So he's, then Beden Ibn or Beden Ibn Sesen, Sesen Ibn Beden, no. Beden Ibn Sesen, sorry, I said it's supposed to be Beden Ibn Sesen. Beden Ibn Sesen actually becomes Muslim in Yemen. And that eases, that eases the relationship between the, well, the relationship in expanding Islam now southern words and now in Yemen. Look at that. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. You, there's no war. No war was waged here. And Baden Ibn Sasan, who, Baden Ibn Sasan, who was actually, um, you know, the, the king considered, well, the deputy, the king um, in Yemen, later becomes Muslim. And same, similar story actually happens. And now here we're talking about, let's draw again. Um, there's the Arabian Peninsula. I'm going to draw it again. Here's Yemen, and this is um, Iraq and Iran right there. Sorry, guys, for my bad drawing. Now, another similar story. Well, the the Quraysh, Quraysh right now was in a treaty, but other people were not comfortable with this treaty, and that is the king of Bahrain and the king of Oman. They weren't happy with this and felt that that was going to make the Muslim threat grow. So the, the king of Oman was sending troops in order to fight the Muslims. It's like he's sending them troops all the way from Oman in order to fight the Muslims in, in Medina. But the Muslims, even though they didn't really have the power to wage a war, but still they had to, they, they had to somehow bring in, bring in some power just to kind of, you know, uh, protect themselves from all that. Well, here's a story. This this time, the Muslims, there's, there's only a couple, but they still, it's like, even if there's a bigger army, but we still have to face and do something about them. So the Prophet ﷺ sends a group of Sahaba in order to protect themselves from the coming, that Rumani um, uh, uh, troops and the military that was coming in. So the Muslims, they managed to, to take somebody as a hostage. They have no idea who it is, but they're like, you know what? We're bringing in, they, we, they defeated some soldiers there and they took this guy as a hostage. So here it is. This guy comes in as a hostage. 
the Muslims bring him. Okay, this is Uman right there. This guy, the Muslims really had no clue who this guy is. They, well, he's part of the people that were waging and man managing the war. Whoever he is, just take him because he was part of the people that were fighting. So the Prophet ﷺ gets a message from Jibreel alayhi salam that this is actually the king of Oman himself. Wow. All right. And that wow. was Thumamat ibn Uthan. All right. That that was actually the king himself. Now, Thumama, the Prophet, وسلم, the Prophet وسلم was telling the Sahaba that this is Thumama. And the Sahaba, they were, they were clueless. Okay. But then the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba, they actually tie Thumama, they tie Thumama on a pillar in the masjid, ties him up. The Prophet وسلم, goes to Thumama and he says, Thumama, how are you? And Thumama, he's a king, not anybody to mess with. He says, listen, if you kill me, you know that I have killed many of your people. If you, if you um, ask for, you know, like, what is that called um, when they, when they give, like, it's, it's kind of like a compensation, you ask for money in ransom, that's the word. If you ask for a ransom, I'm a king, and I'll be able to get you the money. And if you release me, I'll be thankful. He's a king, he talks in short messages, he knows his power. So the Prophet ﷺ just nodded his head and came back to him the second day. And he says, Thumama, how are you? And he says, if you kill me, I'm somebody that has blood on his hands. If you ask for a ransom, I'll kill it. I can give it to you. If you, if you let me go, release me, I'll be thankful. The Prophet ﷺ nodded his head and came to him the third day. Thumama, how are you? And he said the same exact thing again. So the Prophet ﷺ just said, I'm gonna free you, go ahead. So Thumama gets freed and Thumama then takes a shower, goes to find any place where, like a public bathroom, takes a shower, buys some clothes, and then goes to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, listen, you were the most face I ever hated. And your city was the most city I ever hate. I, uh, the most city I hate. And your face was the ugliest face in my, in, my, in my eyes. Now, today, your face is the most beloved face for me. Your city is the most beloved city. And your religion is the most beloved religion of mine. I bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship but Allah. And he becomes Muslim. And who's that? That was actually the king of Oman. You guys, no battle took place here. No battle took place. And Thumam ibn Uthal was later to become that leader, that leader to protect the Muslims' backs. And in fact, here's the, here's the strange thing, you guys. Thumam ibn Uthal actually is actually the leader, is actually the leader in Oman, all right? And here's what happened. The people of Quraysh, they were actually getting all the food. In other words, they were considered as the most important imports, food, vegetables, and all the most important goods in produce was actually coming from Thumam ibn Uthal's territory. So Thumam ibn Uthal, later, Thumam ibn Uthal tells the Prophet you know what, allow me to go to Mecca and do Umrah. The Prophet said, no, that's going to be too dangerous. And he said, I'm the king, no, let me go. So the Prophet says, yeah, sure, you can, you can go. So Thumam ibn Uthal goes, but then Thumam ibn Uthal, you guys got to keep in mind, Thumam ibn Uthal goes to Mecca and he's saying, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Now people around him are looking at him like, what are you saying? That's a Muslim prayer. So everybody's looking at him and he continues, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. And they're looking at him like, what did you just say? And then he says it even louder. It's like, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. It's like, yep, I'm saying it again. Do they know who he is? No, they don't yet. But then other people, they point, point, and they're like, this is the king. Don't mess with him. 
What kind of a king? Well, the major important imports that were coming, bringing in the food and produce for Mecca were actually coming under Thumam ibn Athal's rule. So they know that if they dare mess with this king, that that meant total hunger in Mecca. So Thumam ibn Uthal tells the Prophet Sallam, if they dare do anything to you, just tell me, and I'll just end any type of produce and other food to come into Mecca, and that way they could really surrender. So indeed, the Prophet Sallam didn't tell him to do that, but Thumam ibn Uthal, Thumam ibn Uthal, when, um, when he felt that the, the, that the Qurashi prosecution was growing, so Thumam ibn Athal decided that on his own, that he was going to put like a business, business ending and no imports were going to come in from, from the Oman area, Yamama area, and Oman area. So Thumam ibn Athal ends this, and this causes major illnesses and major malnutrition in Mecca. And it isn't until the people in Mecca beg the Prophet ﷺ, please tell Thumma ibn Athal not to stop these business transactions because it's killing your own people. So the Prophet ﷺ says to Thumma ibn Uthal, can let that business transaction continue. We don't want to kill people in those in those massive numbers like that. It's it's really amazing when you you know unfortunately the stories are not told in the movie Risala. I wish that they had cut those war scenes and brought in stories like the Mabab Nuthal and Abadan Ibn Sasan because that would have been a lot more meaningful than I don't know maybe uh, maybe almost twenty minutes of the movie were battle scenes. So that's one one sad thing about the movie in where, you know, battle scene took a lot of time rather than bringing stories like like these. And it's I, unfortunately, they're untold stories and Muslims would only know the story of Uhud and Badr and don't really know the other stories that are really important. A man who goes to bed with his belly full while his neighbor is hungry. He isn't a Muslim. is holier than the blood of a martyr. A man reading is handsome in the sight of God. Learn to read and when learned, teach the people of the book with their Bible, the Christians with their testament must be respected by you. For their books likewise came from God. You must not think of Muhammad as more than a man. He was collecting firewood one day. Let me do it, I said. Why, he said. You are the prophet of God. You can't go round scratching for firewood. But he looked at me, mumbling. God does not like the man who can So this is Khalid ibn Walid actually coming to embrace so Islam right there. It. it wasn't just Khalid ibn Walid, it was Amr ibn As as well, and it was another third person. I think it's Uthman ibn Manfim, I think. Yes, I am the prophet of God, he said. But even I do not know what will become of me. All right, so we're going to stop right here. And inshallah, we'll continue next week. I hope you like those commentaries. And um, I hope you didn't get disturbed by me pausing the video frequently. Um, we'll see you all next week, inshallah, um, Monday, same time, for more commentary, because we need to see what happens to Khalid ibn walid and we need to hear more stories. And inshallah, we'll see you all next week. There were some questions on the chat. Um, I did comment on the issue of Hudaybiyah that women were, were actually included, but then the ayah was revealed as no women are not included. Um, the Muslims got, uh, yes, the Prophet uh, yeah, in the Battle of Uhud, the Muslims, the Muslims, um, the, the dead 
the, the Muslims' bodies were indeed disfigured by some, at least not all, uh, by the people of Quraysh. Um, the rumor that the Prophet ﷺ died because Thabit was wearing clothes of the Prophet ﷺ, this is one of the narrations indeed. All right, so assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, have his peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum.